Join us in the fight to restore liberty and American exceptionalism. Together, let's make the case that our charters of freedom are worth defending and honoring. Right here is where the great American experiment comes alive. Let's get to work. My name is Harold Van Gilder. Uh, this event is brought to you tonight by the Conservative Business League. And it is a debate, a Lincoln Douglas style debate, uh, between the two debaters that will be introduced later. Uh, the Conservative Business League, otherwise known as the CBL, is doing this as a public service uh, to bring information about the Constitution uh, out to forums such as this. And a little bit of makeup of whatever we have our first president, George Washington, and the first lady, Martha, with us tonight. Mr. President, would you come out? Now, the first lady. And President Washington is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and our first First Lady is uh, going to uh, do the invocation. The other way around? Yes. Hey, I'm from Oklahoma, you got to give me one break at least. I get one mulligan. So if you would, uh, please stand. Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou wilt keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and specific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without an humble imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplications, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, well, get ready, take your seats, and uh, uh, three minute opening statements, and after that, I'll go ahead and ask each of the questions. Um, one thing, if you would, on uh, uh, applause. What I would really like to do in order to keep, keep a, get us out of here at 9 o'clock. Yeah, after each debate question, that would be when you can applaud. Either that or at the end. So I think that, you know, there's four questions, there's going to be a lot of dialogue. You can employ it at that point, but not during the debate. Okay? Thank you very much. So, Bear, uh, you're up. Thank you. Uh, it was in 1771 that Samuel Adams said, if we suffer tamelessly attack, an attack on our liberty, we encourage it. If we suffer tamelessly an attack on our liberty, we encourage it. It was four years later in 1774 that King George said to Lord North, we must come to blows to determine whether or not the colonists will be free or whether they will be subjects. And I suspect tonight that we're going to be talking about a number of issues and we're going to trade some blows here tonight. And ultimately we have to determine as Americans whether or not we want to be subjects or whether we want to be free. And we are truly unique in this country. We have a constitution, it's the oldest living constitution in the world. And there's a very good reason for why it has withstood the test of time. I mean, th consider this for a moment. Brazil has had eight constitutions since 1822. Poland has had seven since 1923. Russia has had four since 1917. France has had 15 to our one. Afghanistan has had five in the 20th century alone. This constitution is truly unique and it is worth defending. But when I say that it's worth defending, what I mean is it's worth defending by looking at its original intent. Not by looking at what we think it means today, if it accommodates a political agenda or something, some pet project that we want to move forward with. It's truly looking to the original intent. What was the meaning? What was the understanding? And what we have today is ultimately courts who have castrated this document. We have politicians that have politicized it. And ultimately we have people that have simply brushed it aside. I am a person that believes the Constitution is not the problem. The Constitution is emphatically the answer.
Without question, it is emphatically the answer. And it's time for the American people to embrace it, to understand this uniqueness, and to move forward and recognize that if we, in fact, do embrace it, better days are coming in America. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Weiser. I'm a former uh, history teacher, social studies in uh, Mojave County, taught in Bullhead City and in Kingman. And I would also like to talk about the Constitution. Our Constitution is, keep in mind, our second attempt at creating government for the United States. The first attempt was the Articles of Confederation. The original suggestion of the Articles of Confederation is that we could depend on all men to be of good spirit and follow the rules and help each other out uniform. Uh, so the uh, Articles of Confederation wound up with no central strength. It didn't uh, establish national taxes. It didn't have a judicial uh, branch in it. And it was a failure. Our Constitution that we have now is a process of uh, multiple years of work by people, John, uh, I mean James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and I believe that what they created is something that's supposed to continue on into today's world and be applicable to what we, the challenges that we face. I think that it is our job as uh, current citizens to try to understand the Constitution and live up to its examples. In fact, you could almost say that America's history has been our attempt to live up to the founding fathers' ideals. Okay, thank you. All right, now for the first question, uh, and uh, Mr. Krause will have the affirmative argument for four minutes. The question is, should there be no limits on the free exercise of religion? Mr. Krause? Well, I'm a first-generation American. Uh, my, my mother's side came here in 1949 from Switzerland, and they came here for the opportunity to relish in the free exercise of religion. It was something that prompted them to come here and an opportunity to take advantage of something that is very unique throughout the world. The ability to worship according to the dictates of your own conscience. And that's precisely what the First Amendment says. It says, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. The converse of that is this, that government cannot utilize sanctions. They cannot utilize sanctions against an individual in order to punish them for behaving in ways that would conform with their religious freedom, with their religious worldview. And what we have going on in America right now, and it's always problematic, freedom is always problematic when we get into this uh, idea that we want to tell other people what to do. Seems to me that everybody in this room would agree that we don't want to live in a culture where we're being told constantly what to do. But that's precisely what's going on when we look at the free exercise of religion. We don't have to look very far. We don't have to look very long ago. It's in the very recent past. Look at what happened in New Mexico. Look at what's happened in Oregon, in Washington, in New Jersey, in Georgia, in Michigan. There's a constant attack on the free exercise of religion. The photographer in New Mexico, the baker in Oregon, the florist in Washington. These individuals were discriminated against because they chose to run their business in conformity with their own religious ideas and values. And SB 1062 is something that happened here in Arizona not too long ago. And it's sad because it was painted, the picture that was painted was one that it was discriminatory, that individuals were uh, in fact going to discriminate if in fact given this protection under SB 1062, and essentially what SB 1062 did was this. It said that if an individual chooses to not serve an individual because it would violate their religious beliefs, this law would protect them. The fact of the matter is that we really shouldn't have needed a law like this because the First Amendment already makes that very clear. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So this law was not about discrimination, despite the fact that individuals out there were saying it was about discrimination. Couldn't have been further from the truth. The fact of the matter is this was about preventing discrimination against individuals who chose to act in accordance with their religious beliefs. I want you to think about this for a moment, because you're constantly going to hear that it was about discrimination. But here's what this bill did rather well. Consider this. 
What about the photographer? The photographer who says, I don't want to go out and take pictures of the neo-Nazi rally because it would violate my religious beliefs. What about the Muslim caterer who's told you've got to show up and you've got to cater at a particular event and you've got to serve pork? There's nobody here in this room that would stand for that sort of discrimination against an individual who stands on religious values. Nobody. A person does not lose their faith because they decide to start a business. A person does not leave their faith at the door when they leave their homes each and every day. The bottom line is here's what we have to ask. What do you want, America? Do you want the boot of government on your neck or do you truly want to live free? That's the question we have to answer tonight. Thank you. Okay. Can you please hold up, hold up applause, please? Okay, Mr. Weiser, you've got a negative cross exam in one minute. I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Prozer, when we talk about no restrictions on religion, I'm sure that you're aware that, that that's an abstract statement. And that when it comes to the reality, we're going to have to have limits to everything. This building, for example, has limits, and that gives us the frame that we're inside of. Uh, for example, if the religion said sacrificing babies, I doubt that you would be in favor of that. I'm supposing that. That's correct. Uh, no. But that would be a religious uh, value for some people. And so we're going to have to say that, you know, we have to have reasonable expectations of what is acceptable and what is not. Your uh, assertion about, uh, wait, I'm beginning to get lost. I'm supposed to ask you a question. Um, All right. I would ask you, so does your uh, decision of absolute freedom of religion include people's rights to sacrifice others' babies? No. So you don't really believe in freedom of religion? I do believe in freedom of religion, but I don't believe that an individual can use their freedom to infringe on the rights of other individuals. Including uh, when it comes to commerce? You have to define commerce. Well, you gave examples of people doing business. Correct. Uh, I think of Hobby Lobby, for example. Is Correct. something that comes to my mind of an infringement of one person infringing on thousands of other people's religious values. I would disagree with the assumption that there is an infringement going on both ways. Okay, we have time. All right. Um, thank you. Next, we have a negative argument uh, by Mr. Weiser. You have five minutes. I probably won't use this entire five minutes, but I really want people to stop thinking in terms of absolutes and abstractions and start talking about the real reality of, of the practice of religion. At the time that they wrote this constitution, there were 13 colonies that had just figured out how to get together as states, and they weren't doing such a good job because it was during the Articles of Confederation times, there was lots of disputes among these states. One of the central arguments that they had at this time was over religion. The different, uh, there were seven of the original 13 colonies that had been formed in some way about somebody's religion. Uh, take, for example, Massachusetts, which was a colony unto itself and spawned three other colonies of people trying to get away from these guys because they didn't like their religion. So when we decided that we were going to have an establishment of uh, uh, a rule for religion. The idea was that it should not uh, be inflicted on anyone. I mean, uh, George and Martha are here. They were among the uh, first deists that were uh, celebrated in American history along with Benjamin Franklin and Article 6 in the Constitution. Well before we even got to the point of adding amendments, establishes that there wouldn't be no uh, structure of religion in the United States, no official religion, no religious oath, and if you were going to have a theocracy, you wouldn't put a sentence like that into your passage. So I, I'm going to say that we, we already have a, a functioning example of freedom of religion, but Mr. Croce, we have to have some sort of restrictions. People could say that their religion did all sorts of things that we wouldn't necessarily approve of as, as a society. Um, Mr. Weiser, do you believe that the Jewish photographer should be compelled to go and take pictures of a neo-Nazi rally if that in fact would violate their religious beliefs? I do not. Do you believe that the Muslim caterer should be forced to in fact uh, serve pork at an event that they're being hired for? I do not. Do you believe that a Jewish deli should be forced to bake a cake and on top of the cake write something like happy birthday Hitler? 
I would. I think I'd like to see that cake, but I don't believe that should happen. So you, you don't. Kind of funny. You, uh, I, I would find it rather offensive uh, if you ask me. But so, you, so you do believe that in fact individuals should be able to reject business opportunities uh, because it would violate their religious freedoms. I do agree with that. Okay, thank you. So, uh, can I move on to my narrative? Very good, thank you. Uh, here's the point. Uh, I think we could talk about all kinds of examples where an individual who uh, exercises certain religious beliefs would do something that we might find offensive. That many of us, maybe all of us in the, this room would say, you know what, that's a really ridiculous worldview. I disagree with the practice. I disagree that they are rejecting an opportunity for a customer to be able to receive a service. I think we would all agree that there are probably some things out there. But the bottom line is that just because a person is free to do something in our society, in a free society, in America, does not mean that it would benefit them. So we, we, we really have an issue here of what is the better alternative? Is the better alternative to force individuals by way of government to behave in ways that you and, I, you and I may approve of or disapprove of? Or is the better option to use market forces? That is, if you have somebody like in New Mexico, a photographer says, you know what, I'm not going to take pictures of this same-sex wedding. You know what, many of us would find that offensive. But what's the better alternative, to use market forces or use the marketplace of ideas, that is the contest of ideas, to drive that individual out of business or keep him in business? Really, that's what it ultimately comes down to. When you look at involuntary servitude, think about what's going on in this country right now when it comes to religious freedom. There can be no question, there can be no argument that religious freedom is being attacked in America today. And if we want to look at what's going on, we have to ask ourselves about involuntary servitude. Look at what happened in New Mexico with the sanction. Look at what happened in Washington and in Oregon with the investigations. Look at what happened. Whether it's with lawsuits and fines or whips and chains, it's all the same. That is the bottom line in America. And if we're going to call ourselves free, if we're truly going to call ourselves free, we have to ask ourselves, how much do we, are we willing to tolerate freedom? Because our willingness to tolerate freedom is found in not our willingness to defend ideas that we agree with. It's found in our, our, our perception and our willingness to defend ideas that we find despicable. That's what freedom is. That's what America is. That's what this Constitution defends. And I believe that most of us in this room, if we sit back and analyze what's actually going on, we would ultimately say, we want freedom. Freedom ultimately means being able to do things that the majority may not find agreeable. We live in a constitutional republic. We do not live in a democracy. Republic, it's about the rule of law. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche said this, he who hunts dragons must beware, lest he become a dragon himself. That's what I fear that we're doing in this country with individuals who want to target other individuals who embrace sincerely held religious values. They're becoming dragons themselves by taking individuals down who are exercising valid religious beliefs. That's not the America I believe in. The America I believe in believes in the idea of republic and being able to allow individuals to do things that we might find despicable. And so long as they're not hurting other individuals, we protect those freedoms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brody. Uh, Mr. Wiley, four minutes, negative rebuttal. Well, I'm not sure that the people that you are speaking to necessarily hold to your values. I mean, you may actually hold to these values that uh, you're such a strong, abstract believer in freedoms that even if people were doing criminal acts, if that was their expression of their religious freedom, you'd be okay with that. That's not where I'm coming from. I, I want us to keep in mind that when you talk about some sort of a reasonable limit, then you're saying that there is one. Um, I, I look at Hobby Lobby, for example, something that, that bothered me. I would agree that uh, religion is under attack. Freedom from religion is under attack. The Christian religion in America is losing ground, but not because it's being attacked by uh, people who are anti-Christianity. It's because they're not doing their job of keeping people interested in, in the um, thought. You talk to people under 30, most of them don't even know what uh, their Christianity is about anymore. They have like a surface, but they don't read the Bible. You're not, when you look for some way of saying that it's uh, 
some other people who are trying to take apart religion or that uh, America is under attack from uh, people who don't have religion. I, I have to wonder what you're saying. And, and I'm going to also point out that market forces do not solve problems of criminality or morality. They may choose what people make their money off of, but they don't solve issues of morality. And that's why we do have laws. And that's part of the reason we have religion. Uh, see if there's anything else I wanted to add. Um, no, that's essentially the point I wanted to make. Our country was made to protect us from having other people's religion enforced upon us. <coughs> and I think that, that we are still in a country where we need to have that protection. <coughs> As a person who is a Christian myself but respects all religions, I find that the majority of uh, the people I see on TV espousing religion, Christianity, are actually the people who are trying to take away the free exercise of other people's religion. That's my statement. All right, thank you. Um, if you want to applaud, now would be the time. That concludes question number one. Now we'll move on to question number two.